And what we're going to try to do is, uh, there's a couple of graphics or pictures today that are going to help us along the way. And so we're going to try to keep half of the lights off so that you can see the graphics. But if you can't, just let us know and we can switch the lights that are on or go from there. Um, but again, we'll be in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 17. And then we'll also be in, in Genesis, uh, we'll start in Genesis 3. Then we'll make a little stop in 10 and 11 as we dig into the harlot of Babylon today. Let's go to the Lord and ask Him to bless our time. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time that You have put together, Lord, for us to be able to gather and to dig into Your Word. And it's good to praise You. It is good to um, be with other believers and to, to learn and to grow in you. And so we come to you and we pray that you would, would bless our time of study. We pray for our country as a nation as this weekend we, we stop and pause and we thank and honor those that have served and given the greatest sacrifice for our country. And we pray that you be with all those families that are mourning the loss of a loved one that has been taken in the act of duty. And so Lord, we, we pray your blessing on them this weekend. And now as we, turn our, um, as we turn our attention to the book of Revelation, chapter 17, and we dig into this harlot of Babylon, I pray that, God, you would give us a fresh perspective into this chapter. There are so many images, there are so many different things that, are, that can be difficult for us to understand. And so I pray that you would be the one that would be our guide. I pray that you would give us direction. Lead us through this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alrighty. Chapter 17, verse 1. As you will see, we have a very interesting chapter ahead of us. Uh, we get introduced to a new character and one that is, well, there's a lot to her. And so let's read in verse 1 and, and you'll see what I mean. It says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, come, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornications. And on her forehead was, was, was written, on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? Let's pause right there for a minute. Interesting, interesting chapter, right? I'm going to have to um, go to the next slide. This is kind of a, uh, this is a picture of kind of this scene, the great harlot of Babylon. As you can see described here, it, she is quite a scene. Um, scarlet robes sitting on this creature with multiple heads and multiple horns. <clears throat> and so we're going to dig into her today. And she is known here as the harlot of Babylon. Harlot, in, your, in another translation, is whore. Or prostitute. Quite a nickname that is given to this character, right? And so it's interesting right off the bat that you have John who is seeing all of these different things. Looks on and sees this creature. And it says in verse 6, I marveled with great amazement. And then the angel says to John, why do you marvel? Isn't that curious? He's looking on at this thing and he's going, what, what in the world is this? And the angel who showed him this goes, why are you marveling? And it's interesting because as we go through this chapter, I think that we'll kind of do the same thing. As we look on at who is Babylon, 
what is Babylon? And different times we look on and just go, man, marvel at what great amazement this is. And it's so interesting that this angel stands next to him and says, well, well why do you marvel? So this is a pretty intense chapter and quite an intro. But before we dig in, let's go over a couple things to hopefully help us on our path. So we're going to have this picture described to us. And you go, what, why does it look like this? Or why do we have symbols? And, and what does it actually look like? We have to remember that throughout this chapter, John is most likely going to be talking about those that are in power at this time. And so for him to get a letter out, it would be very difficult because if he says who the specific person is, it very well could be that they would oppress his letter and then it wouldn't get out. And so remember, as we talked a couple of weeks ago, is that we have to use other things in the Bible to help kind of understand what in the world is going on. We're going to learn here in a minute that Babylon is the system of religion. Okay, and you go, well, then why didn't it just say that? Remember, he's got to be able to kind of get it out because, okay, we read this letter and we as Christians with the Holy Spirit as our guide and the Bible as our guide, we look on at this and we're still going, who in the world is this beast with seven heads and ten horns? Think about the people that are trying to read his letter to figure out if they're going to let it out. Oh, what is that letter that that guy John sent it out? I don't know. They've got beast and horns and multiple heads it's weird it's chicken scratch it's crazy just let you know and so you maybe that's why we have so many of these different symbols is that he was able to get it out and get it to his readers without it being oppressed second thing is very interesting is that there's an interpretation that is given in this chapter for these things now it's interesting when that happens when the lord gives you what the the image is and then comes right alongside of us and gives us what the interpretation is you're going to notice that a lot of different scholars go back and forth on what the interpretation means. And remember, if the Lord hasn't revealed something to us, that means that he didn't necessarily want us to know it. And so we're not going to spend that much time going, I think it's this or I think it's that because we don't know. The interpretation was given and we've got to become comfortable with the fact that we may not totally understand what the interpretation means. The last thing before we dig back in is that this is judgment. Remember, these, these angels were bringing judgment. And so this is going to be judgment upon the religious system that Satan had ushered in. So that means it's not pretty. Right, we've got two more chapters of wickedness. And then we're going to start to see some triumph. And so for today, we also have a bunch of craziness that we've got to dig through. But let's go back to verse 1. It says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me, come, I will show you the judgments of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Okay, so the angel says, this is going to be a judgment that you're going to see. Now, this would be best understood as another one of those parenthetical chapters. We're not sure that it necessarily is in chronological order. This very well could be kind of like a footnote. <laughs> In a story where it's going to tell different events that have happened. <clears throat> the main character that we'll see in this chapter is the harlot, the prostitute, the whore. Not a flattering term, but it is one that is given to this character. Today we're going to dig into the fall of the world's religious organization that we will see in chapter 17 known as Babylon. Let's talk about Babylon for a minute. So there's a couple of things to note. Number one, we recently have been talking about Babylon. Let me give you a couple of references. If you go back to chapter 16, verse 19, this is what it had already told us about Babylon. It said, now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So we already know that judgment and the wrath of God is coming upon this city. In 14.8, then another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now all throughout scripture, Babylon is a very well talked about city. Babylon is mentioned 287 times in scripture, more than any other city except Jerusalem. 
The other thing to know about Babylon is that it has multiple meanings. First, it was an actual city, which we'll dig into in a minute. It was established in Genesis. It was also the kingdom that, um, that conquered Judah. Today it would be known as a place in Iraq. It's 50 miles south of Baghdad. So we know where there was this actual city used to be. Second, it's a figurative city, representing Satan's move to influence mankind to become like God. What we will chronic today, and we'll go back to the start of mankind, is going to be how Satan set up this religious system to try to mirror what God was doing. Babylon is Satan's headquarters, not hell. Sometimes we think that Satan is in hell and he's the master over it. It's not the truth. It's Babylon. You'll see from the very beginning that Satan lured man into thinking that we can become like God. And that is called religion. It's man's way of getting to God. When Jesus hit the, the scene, he destroyed this way of thinking. He created the way to relate to God, which is relationship. Religion is Satan's. Relationship is Jesus. And we can see them contradicting each other all throughout history. You go, Ben, isn't Christianity a religion? It's not. Jesus came to destroy that. Religion is man's way of going to God. You can't get to him. Jesus came down and got us. And he did it through a relationship. John chapter 3, you must be born again. <clears throat> For us to totally understand that, we're going to have to go and start at the beginning. So I want you to go to your Bibles. And we're going to go to Babylon's origin. Go to Genesis chapter 3. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Die. Now underline this next section or at least note it. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree desired to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So in the garden, this was the first move of man to become like God. We can be as smart as God. And you see how Satan set it up. Did God say, if you do this, you can be like God. That is the establishment of the religious system. You don't need God. You can be like God. And here's the way that you can do it. I'll flip a couple chapters and it'll start to build. Let's go to chapter 10. You're going to see a very interesting character start to emerge. Genesis 10, 8, and 11. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be mighty. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, at the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Iraq. Akkad, Kelna, and the land of Shinar. From the land he went to Assyria and he built Nineveh. So this man hits the scene named Nimrod. Tom, can you go to the next slide? So this is kind of this, uh, this hunter character. He becomes a very interesting, an interesting guy. <clears throat> Let's take a look at his great work that it says that he did there. Let's go to chapter 11. It says, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. 
But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are, are, are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore the name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So we have this Tower of Babel, also known as Babylon. It was man's attempt to become like God and to reach him. And their leader, his name was Nimrod. Nimrod means rebel. Josephus believed that it was likely under Nimrod's direction that the building of Babel and its tower began. In addition to Josephus, this is also the view that was found in the Talmud. In all different types of Jewish research, several of the early Judaic sources also assert that the king Aphrael, who wars with Abraham later in Genesis, is none other than Nimrod himself. The Jewish historian Josephus further describes Nimrod. Listen to what he says. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as it were through his means. that They were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which precurred their happiness. He gradually changed the government into tyranny. Seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. He also said he would be revenged on he also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So writers have said that Nimrod was actually, well, a Nimrod. He was a rebel against God, and he built this tower so that he could, number one, not have to deal with the flood again. But it's also said that Nimrod was actually trying to kill God. Sure does make it a lot easier to understand why God was so upset that they were building this tower, right? He causes confusion, and they start speaking all different types of language, and that becomes known, you know, Babel, confusion. So we have this establishment of a a system known as Babylon. Now I would recommend reading this book by Alexander Hyssop called The Two Babylons. His work is probably the deepest and although many argue with his findings, there have been none that have been able to refute it. Now listen to what he says when he chronicles the life of Nimrod. He says, Nimrod married a woman named Semiramis. Nimrod was killed and went up into the sun. She then nicknamed him Baal, one that we know from the Old Testament. She was then miraculously impregnated by Nimrod and named the baby Tammuz. Tammuz was a mighty hunter and was killed while hunting. When this happened, Semiramis called for 40 days of fasting from meat to raise Tammuz from the dead. Now these three are talked about in many cultures. Don't you go to the next slide. You may have heard some of them. In Syria, they were worshipped by the names Ishtar and Tammuz. In Phoenicia, they were worshipped by the name Eshterah and Baal. In Egypt, they were worshipped by the name Isis and Horus. In Greece, they were worshipped by the names Aphrodite and Eros. And in Rome, they were worshipped by the names Venus and Cupid. Now, all of these types of, of Babylonian cultures have crept into multiple places, including Israel. Ezekiel protested against the ceremony of weeping for Tammuz. Just look up Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. Jeremiah mentions the heathen practice of making quakes for the cakes for the Queen of Heaven, which is also one of the nicknames of Semiramis. In Jeremiah 7, 8, and then Jeremiah 44 and 17. 
And it wasn't just Israel, gang. All of these Babylonian folklore and things have crept in into multiple cultures, even into the church. Listen, when Tammuz died, it was said that she fasted for 40 days and called for everybody to stop eating meat for 40 days, which became known as Lenten, where we get our practice of Lent. After the resurrection of Tammuz, there was a great celebration in honor of Semiramis and Tammuz. December 25th was said to be the birthday of Tammuz. Jesus wasn't supposed to be born. It's none of the calculations go to December. They wanted to take over a pagan holiday. So baby Tammuz is you know, where one of the reasons why they picked December 25th, because it was a popular holiday. Listen to Easter. Easter's origins. This was taken from a homeschool curriculum. It says, The beginning of Easter goes back to the springtime ritual begun by Queen Semiramis following the death of Tammuz. Legend has it that through her tears, Tammuz could be resurrected in reincarnated, a reincarnated form of new vegetation on the earth. With the spread of Christianity many years later, it was a common practice to adopt the existing non-Christian festivals and assimilate them into Christian theology. Because Queen Semiramis, also known as Estra, was the goddess of spring, and her symbolism dealt with renewal and rebirth, the Christian belief in the resurrection of Christ fit well with these themes. Today, American history teaches, teaches us that Easter was dismissed as a pagan holiday by the nation's founding Puritans and not, did not begin to be observed widely until the Civil War. The Babylonians considered the egg a sacred symbol that represented Ostara's fertility in new life. The Babylonians believed in a fable about a huge egg that fell from heaven into the Euphrates River, which hatched Queen Semiramis. Egg dying was observed in the evil rituals celebrating the spring equinox. The Egyptians hung decorated eggs in the temple, and the Romans used decorated eggs in processions honoring the mother goddess. The Druids used the eggs as their sacred emblem. The Easter Bunny. Rabbits have long been recognized as a fertility symbol and can also be traced back to practices established by Semiramis. In the 1500s in Germany, some people believed that bunnies laid red eggs on Holy Thursday and multicolored eggs the night before Easter Sunday. Later, the custom evolved into edible Easter bunnies made out of sugary pastries. The tradition came to America during the 1700s with the Pennsylvania Dutch who immigrated with from Germany and evolved into chocolate Easter bunnies and eggs during the American Civil War. Children believed that if they were good to the Oster Hall, the Easter bunny, he would lay a nest of colored eggs. <laughs> kind of creepy, right? You'll see that a lot of the different holidays that we have actually have Babylonian origin. And it makes sense, doesn't it? There's a there's even different things that you dig in that the um, there's a, a statue of Mary holding the baby Jesus. Well, you can actually find statues of Semiramis holding baby Tammuz. That it's almost the same exact character. So many different things that as you look back on, you go, "Oh my goodness, that's very interesting." It says that Nimrod also uh, established Nineveh, right? If we remember, who do we remember that went to Nineveh, right? The prophet Jonah was thrown up out of the belly of a whale. Well, legend says that when he came up out of the belly of the whale, that this great revival happened. Well, there's other readings that say that the people of Nineveh, they actually started to worship Jonah. And they started to make these hats that had a fish hat. And they believe that that's actually where the, the Pope's hat, which actually looks kind of like a fish head on the top, it actually has origins there. Tom, if you go back to our slide, you'll see it's very interesting that her hat looks very similar to that, doesn't it? Kind of has this peak to it. Now, a lot of people refute these different things, but I find it very interesting. There's more. Babylonian, has, has, Babylonian culture has already been talked about in the book of Revelation in the church. Let me show you what I mean. This comes from Pastor Jack Hibbs. He says, according to the Babylonian cult Semiramis, 
act of priestly intercession confirmed upon her power to deliver a soul from the Babylonians called the doctrine of purgatory, which is the foundation to the name of Pergamum or Pergamos. In fact, we have to go back to Revelation chapter 2 when Jesus was speaking to the churches. He said something very interesting to the church in Pergamos. Listen to this. Go back to Revelation chapter 2. He says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, These things say he who has a sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Pergamos, purgatory. That's, that's where Satan dwells. Purgatory, Easter, Christmas, Lent, Easter eggs, these are all evidence of Satan's created false religion. Babylon is Satan's great work. So now you have some insight on Nimrod in Babylon. Let's go back and read verse 1 again. It says then, chapter 17, then one of the seven angels who, came, who had seven bulls came and talked to me, saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Remember, the grand story that we're going through is unveiling Jesus. Here in chapter 17 and 18, the judgment of God will come upon the great harlot or this religious system that Satan created called Babylon. We're going to deal with the religious system and then we'll deal with the, the political and the world system as well. Verse 2. And on whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now the kings of the earth are being lured into Satan's trap much like the men of Israel were lured in during the days of Balaam. If you remember that, they tried to get Israel to fall into sin. And they didn't have any luck. And so Balaam gave them this way and said, listen, do it with, with them, with women. And so the women came in and duped the men into false worship or idol worship by means of sex. Fornication, if you circled that word next to it, you could write the word porneia. It's where we get our word pornography. It is sexual immorality. All throughout Scripture, God warns us not to be given to fornication. And that takes on two, two meanings. One, physically, we are not to be giving in to sexual immorality. Sex is supposed to be between a man and a woman. A husband and a wife, I'm sorry. Anything outside of that is fornication. Secondly, fornication shows us it's kind of a symbol of how our relationship is to be with God. We are supposed to be pure and not worship any idols. And so at different times, God will use this reference of fornication. And that's exactly what it is. When we start worshiping other idols, it is very much like cheating on a spouse. It is sexual immorality is fornication. It's interesting. It also talks about here is it's a prostitute, a whore, a harlot. That is also a metaphor to give yourself over to false worship. We're told all throughout scripture to maintain purity physically and metaphorically by worshiping God only. And being pure within our marriage relationship. So the kings of the earth, they gave themselves over to Babylon to Satan's great work. And it says they were drunk with fornication. That means they loved it. They loved worshiping idols. And as you can see, you start reading about these Semiramis and Tammuz, right? Like, all, in all of these different cultures, whether you believe that this is the way that it went down or not, lots of cultures did, because they put them into place. Everybody here probably knows who Cupid is, right? So, we've all learned about these forms in one way or another, and they're all idol worship. So the kings of the earth, they give themselves over to this. And they love it. They're drunk with her fornication. Then verse 3, it says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So let's pause right there for a minute. So we're, we're in a very interesting place where John is already being taken off into this, in the spirit, and he's being shown things. 
And it's like he's then being taken to another place to be revealed all of this that is happening. It says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman who was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, the great the name, a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. You say, I, I, I'm not sure that I totally understand. How in the world is this going to happen? Well, again, you have to remember that the church is going to be raptured at this point. And everything will be totally different when you get the Christians out of the way. You know, as I've been talking through what's happening in our world right now, it's almost like you can tell that the end times can't come yet. Because the Christians are always in the way. If you notice when something tries to pass, you know, whether it's a law or the school board tries to put in this funky... You know, very um, sex education that's trying to be put into kindergartners. Who's the one that typically steps up and goes, yeah, it's not going to happen? It's the Christians. Right? They come in and they say, hey, we're going we're gonna to change the definition of marriage. Who steps up and goes, yeah, you can't do that. God created the definition. The Christians. We stand up and we go, listen, I hate to be the one to tell you, but you just can't change the definition. Oh, you know, you're, you're so intolerant. How can you do that? Love is love. Wait, wait, wait a minute. We're not talking about that. We're talking about changing the definition of marriage. You, you, we're, we're talking about two separate things. You Christians are against everybody. We're talking about the definition that God has given for marriage. Who, who stands up? Who stands up and goes, we're, we're not going to let that happen? The Christians. We we're always the ones that when they try to change something, we go, yeah, yeah, I can't let that happen. Hey, we think that, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, this curriculum comes through the school systems about how they're going to change the way that we define what is a man and a woman. Who stands up and says, not going to happen? Christians. Oh, you guys are all against transgenderism. You're asking us to change something that we cannot change. I'm not asking you to change something that you cannot change. This is my moral system. And God has told us what is a man and what is a woman. And who stands up and goes, I'm not going to budge? It's us. Now what happens when you get us out of the way? It will all come flooding through. This system of Babylon, this religious system that has been trying to Water down the gospel. Think about what will happen when the Christians are gone. Think about what they'll do with the church and with Christianity. Think about how watered down it truly will get. And then you understand how quickly this can happen. How people can be drunk with the, with the fornication. <clears throat> drunk with the blood of the saints. With the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. You now get how, oh my goodness, I absolutely see how this all could go down. You also have to remember how the church started and how Satan attacked it. See, all of this stuff has seeped into the church and it's all been building and building and building even since the beginning. And you think about how the church started, right? So in the book of Acts, you have this, this church that starts out and they're kind of on the run to begin with. Right? The, the Roman culture was trying to suppress it and to stomp it out. And, and then every time that they tried to stomp it out, it just spread and spread and spread and spread. But then something very interesting happened. In 380 AD, Empress Thaddeus issued the Edict of Thessalonica, which established Christianity as the official state religion. So it got to the point where the leaders saw that the Christians were doing some very interesting things. Number one, they were adopting children. They were caring for widows. They were being very good to the community. The other thing that they saw was that they were giving to fellowships financially. The government looked on and said, let's get in. And so the state and the church 
came together. And it was a deadly, deadly handshake. One that we're still trying to sort our way out of. It's where you get the, the rise of Roman Catholicism. It came in and a lot of these positions became intertwined together. And we're still, we still have them. And what it did was it gave the opportunity for the church to become... Satan was able to get his claws in by the government coming in and trying to control in lots of different areas. So even from the beginning, we can still see Satan working his way into our relationship system with God and making it a religion. Let's read on. He says, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and will go to perdition. We can say hallelujah to that. The beast will end up in destruction and it's coming soon. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. Let's pause right there for a minute. I find it very interesting that the angel says, here comes wisdom, as this interpretation comes that we've been trying to figure out for 2,000 years. It's kind of like he's saying, like, you know, I'm going to give you some wisdom with this. And, and we, it would be wise for us to know that this interpretation, right, is somehow very wise, even though we tend to argue over what it means. I want to I say one more thing before we dig into what all this means. I think it's really interesting, or I think it's really important to rely on the principle of an issue instead of the practical. And you go, what does that mean? If we can be good with the principle of what something means, we'll find that we'll get along a lot easier. When it comes to the practical way of how you lay it out, I think it's okay to have some different variations and some flexibility there. Right? If you and I can agree, we'll take one example. If we can agree that drunkenness is a bad thing, right? we can agree on that. Practically, that may look different for you and I. But as long as we can agree on the principal issue of it, the practical really isn't that big of a deal. We tend to argue in the practical instead of the principal. <clears throat> so now when it comes to this, we're not going to know who these kings are, even though there are so many different guesses. Let's take a heed. Here is the mind which has wisdom. It says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time time. So let's pause right there for a minute. I will tell you that at the beginning of our study, Rich said to me, Ben, if you can tell me who this king is, you will explain the whole entire book of Revelation to me. And I have studied from that point until this, and my conclusion is, I don't know. And so I guess you could tell Rich, I cannot explain. <laughs> there are so many guesses on who these kings are. And I find it interesting, right? Some say that the kings are actually mountains, and these mountains are the seven mountains that are around Rome. But look at the text. It says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So it's a very good chance that she is sitting over top of Rome. Now, what religious system do we know right now that is sitting over top of Rome? Roman Catholicism, right? And that would make a lot of sense. Now you say, Ben, are you saying that the great whore of Babylon is Catholicism? I'm actually saying that all religious systems have a part in this. So you can put every movement into it. It looks like we all have dealt. Anybody celebrates Jesus on December 25th? It seems like we've all been duped a little bit, right? But there's a really good chance, and it would make sense that... It's over Rome. Now, very well could be that it's not. It also says there are also seven kings. So there's two meanings. 
Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Five kingdoms have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. Now the best scholars, and I've read guys that our pastor, Pastor Chuck, right? He studied under John Wolbert, and his great work was End Times. And I read his stuff, and he had some great explanations. Some believe that the kings mean kingdoms. You look at the the seven great kingdoms, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece. The present kingdom is Rome, and the future kingdom is the kingdom of the beast. And that would make a lot of sense. But then you go, why didn't he just say kingdoms instead of kings? Because then king has to mean kingdom. Warren Wearsby then says that the, the beast has seven heads, but also has ten horns, which represent the ten kings. And these are special kings. And there's a lot of belief systems on who those kings are. I want to read to you an interesting nugget that Pastor Chuck shared about this section. And this is called the Nero file. Now listen to what he says, and it's a couple pages, so, so go with me for a minute. It says, the fifth emperor of the Roman Empire was Caesar Nero. He was known by the early church as the beast. Isn't that interesting? He is a man of interesting history. And there was a dramatic change in his life. When he first ascended as the Roman emperor, he seemed to be a fairly level-headed fellow. He started many beneficial building projects for the people. He actually started the Corinthian Canal. However, that project was never completed by him. Suddenly, a dramatic change in Nero's life came in Nero's life and he became another person. It's interesting that this drastic change occurred shortly after Paul stood before him in defense of the gospel. When Paul the Apostle was getting the runaround in Caesarea, he appealed to Caesar. Festus, the Roman governor, and said, Have you appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar you shall go. Acts chapter 25, verse 12. Paul was then sent to Rome so that he might appeal his case before Caesar Nero. Listen to what he says. Now I have no doubt that when Pete, when Paul appealed his case before Nero, he made every endeavor to convert the emperor to a belief in Jesus Christ. That was Paul's method. And he defended himself before the Jews as he defended himself before Felix and before Agrippa. He used it as an opportunity to lead these men to Jesus Christ. I am certain that he laid witness on Nero to the likes of which he had never heard. When Paul was through with his defense, Nero knew exactly where he stood in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nero let Paul go, but shortly afterwards, the emperor seemed to turn suddenly mad. I believe that in rejecting the message that Paul was given him, Nero actually opened the door to Satan within his life and became demon-possessed. Nero set Rome ablaze and had an insane glee as the city burned. He used it as an occasion to blame the Christians and to start a bloody movement against them. He would cover the Christians with tar and set them on fire in his garden. Shrieking in the nude, he'd drive his chariot in the midst of the burning bodies of the Christians. He had Paul arrested again, brought back to Rome and beheaded. He brought Peter to Rome and crucified him upside down. At that time, at the time that the Lord was speaking to John in Revelation, Nero had already died. He was, but he is not. But he shall ascend out of the abyss. I believe that the same demon that possessed Caesar Nero will possess the Antichrist who will come to reign over the earth. Thus, all the marks of Caesar Nero will be upon the man of sin. Isn't that interesting? Revelation 13 said, Here is wisdom. Let he who has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. In Greek and Hebrew, the letters have numeric equivalents. In Hebrew, the letters of the name Caesar Nero total to 666. I do believe, this is Pastor Chuck, that the demon which possessed Caesar Nero will possess the Antichrist. In a sense, he will be a reincarnation. As the same demon who came out of the abyss, some of the same deeds and actions seen in Nero will be manifested by this man of sin, which is to come. Pastor Chuck believes that it's Caesar Nero, which is a great guess. 
You say, okay, Ben, what do you think? I struggle to make guesses on things that we don't know. But here's my thought after studying it all of this time. These two chapters are about the fall of Satan's religion, Babylon. And so I think that you could pick out numerous kingdoms and kings that Satan has used throughout time to be identified here. I think that you could make a case that Nimrod should be one of the ones listed as one of the great kings. But I will say that when something is not named in the Bible, I find peace in knowing that it can still remain unnamed. Until then, guess for yourself. Because <laughs> that's the best I could do. I think we have to guess for ourselves because who knows. You know, I, I think that there's times where I look back and I read Old Testament prophecies, especially about the birth of Jesus. And I, I just think about, if I was there, I'd probably be one of the ones going, now when it says a virgin, like, what, what do you mean? You know, what do you think it means? Do you think, do you think? Now when it says that they're going to gamble for the Messiah's clothing, like, how's that going to go down? You know, and they probably had all these different theories about how it would go down. But the thing to know is that it all happened. I just find it hard to believe that anybody could guess that it practically went down exactly how the Lord was laying it out. Part of it is, I think that we'll just sit back and go, there's the seven mountains, there's the kings, there's the horns, and it'll all come together and we'll go, I don't know if I ever would have guessed it like that. And so my guess is, I'm not even going to tell you. Guess for yourself. I think there's a lot of great guesses out there but it will happen let's keep going it says the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition so the beast that that was and is not is himself also the eighth so nero makes a lot of sense because he was if he was re resurrected he would be but if we're really talking about the beast here now, the thing that I think that's important to note in chapter 11 is that he's going to perdition. Amen. Then the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority from one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Now, I love the guesses here. Okay, so there's going to be ten, <clears throat> 10 horns, which are 10 kings. They will receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. They will be of one mind. And they will give their power and authority to the beast. Now, this almost has to become the European Union. Right? And we as Christians, we have been watching what has been happening with the European Union for decades going that's it we know that there's going to come a time where 10 kingdoms are going to come together and they're going to form this alliance with rome becoming the hub listen to what pastor david guzik says about this he says there is little doubt that the eu the Euro european union itself claims to be the successor to the ancient roman empire the EEC started in 1957 when six European nations met to talk about combining their nuclear, coal, and economic resources. They met together in Rome and signed the Treaty of Rome, the beginning of the present EU. In many places in Europe, the EU flag is just as prominent as the national flag. I'm going to have Dom skip to the next slide. It's very interesting that there is a statue outside of the European Union. And guess what it is? A woman riding a beast. Even if you were to look at the euro, scent number two on the euro is a woman riding a beast. It's almost like they, they want it to happen, right? And we sit around and go, how will this happen? They're pushing for it. <coughs> it will happen and it's coming. 
Who will be the ten? At different times, there's been ten. One's almost dropped down. One's come in. And listen, once the church goes, the Antichrist comes in and starts making deals. I don't think there will be any problem with ten of these European nations coming together and making this all happen. To be honest with you, and I've, I've, I've been saying this all week. I think that there's been a couple American leaders that haven't let this happen. Right? Jerusalem was not going to be attacked under our last president. So we knew that there's no way that the end times could happen. But as you start to see favor taken away from Israel, you will start to notice that the way is being paved. If you take the Christians out of the mix, it can happen just like that. And it would make a lot of sense. Right now, if somebody attacked Israel, at least for the last four years, you know the United States would have been there to help. We would have been, we are their best buddy. So something will happen that when Israel is going to be attacked, the United States is not in the Bible. So either we're not really here, we're not a player, or we don't really care. But that's what is coming. That's what's ahead. So anyways, it'll happen. It is coming. And all of these things you can start to see. Little hints of how it'll all go down. Alright, we only have a little bit left here. It says, verse 14. These, these will make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Amen. Amen. Satan's had his time. But it is coming to an end. Jesus will overcome. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. And there's coming a time where he will war. And, and, and don't you just almost feel bad for Satan that he's actually going to go to war with Jesus? We know that Satan isn't even going to be able to last against an angel. So what about Jesus? Almighty creator? It's going to be awesome. I don't know if we'll get into it next week, but the week after that, definitely. Verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw... Where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. I think that's quite sad. The harlot has seduced people, multitudes, and nations. So many nations will be duped by this system, the Babylonian system. And it will all come together like we talked about a couple weeks ago. Once you get the Christians out of the way, I think it will be very easy to say, let's all do this together. There's room. There's many paths to get to heaven, they'll say. When, that ha when that's said right now, who says no? The Christians. No, there's not. There's not many paths to get to heaven. There is one way to get to heaven. Oh, Christian, you guys are so tough on people. You need to be a little bit more inclusive. We need to welcome people. Everybody. Jesus came for all people. He did come for all people. But he died so that people could come and, and can come into heaven. And there's only one way to get there. You have to put your faith in him. Yeah, but the gospel that you guys talk about, it's just so, it's too much. It's too much. Some people don't, they, not everybody has to believe what you believe. Right? And you see the pushback that is there. Once you take the Christians out, there'll be many ways it'll be taught. Jesus said, narrow is the path. Now there's this other path that is broad. The path to destruction. And, and, and everybody will be going there. There's this other path that leads to me. It'll be, it'll be narrow. You will find it. Now you get how easily this will happen. You take Christians out of the mix, now the church becomes all welcoming. And nations will be duped. I recently read an article that it was, a, I think it was a, a certain age group that Pew Research was doing, and they were 
they were asking how many, how many of the people that they polled were Christians. And 50% came back and said we're Christians. Upon further questioning, it was revealed that only six of them met the requirements for what we would consider an evangelical Christian. And isn't that the way that it is? Isn't that what you find? Lots of people claim it. Because Jesus is life insurance to people. Okay, you want me to pray a little prayer? I'll do that, no problem. If that means I get to heaven, do I have to change my life? Yeah, I'll pray, sure. Jesus, come into my life. All right, let's get back at it. I, you know, I'm good. That's, that's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus came for. He came and died for us to take away our sins. And we put our faith in him, but we've got to turn from our sin. You don't see that right now, do you? Very early on in my Christian walk, I was reading this book about this guy that broke down John chapter 3 and what it meant to be born again. And at the end of his findings, he was talking about the millions, hundreds of millions of people that claim to be Christians in the world. And he said, my guess is that only 5% of them are actually born again Christians. And when I read that, I went, no way. You think that 5% of people that are claiming to be Christians are the only ones that are going to make it? And from that point, I have realized that he is most likely a lot more right than I was at that point. Because you start walking with people and you, you know, in, in America, look at how many people claim to be Christians. And then you, you start getting to know their life and you go, that doesn't match. That doesn't match. That doesn't match. Do you read your Bible? Uh, you know, I, 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 got one, I got one at home. You listen to the way they talk and you just go, man, that doesn't sound like what's coming out of their mouth is edifying and building up others. And there's probably no wonder that probably five or six percent are actually living in a relationship with God. All right, let's finish up. Verse 16. It says, in the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put, put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So religion will lead multitudes to destruction. Satan will use and abuse this system of religion very much like a prostitute is used, abused, and then thrown away. The religion, this system, will end up being hated by the beast. This religion will end up becoming naked, desolate, and will end up being burned with fire. So it will be thrown away. This church, this religious system. And it says that God has put it into their hearts to fulfill this purpose. Isn't that interesting? Kind of like Pharaoh, how God hardened their, his heart. Pharaoh was just in this path of stubborn, stubborn, stubborn. He got to the point where God said, fine, if you're going to be this stubborn, I will solidify you in that stubbornness. Because you read all of this through Revelation and you go, why don't people turn? Because our hearts are hard. And they will be duped. The very interesting thing is that it says that they will be doing this in unity while reigning over the earth. So unity and prosperity is not where it's at. And I think that's encouraging. So let's apply. This is a crazy chapter to try to apply to your life, right? Here we go. Number one, get ready and get your sword of the spirit ready. The sword of the spirit referred to in Ephesians chapter six is called the Machaira. Okay, and sometimes when we hear the, you know, the sword of the spirit is the word of God, right? We think of this big, huge, long sword. It was actually an 18 inch dagger and it was for hand to hand combat. What that means is, is that... 
we know that Satan can use the Bible. Satan came at Jesus with Scripture. And so what, it, what that means is not only do you need to read your Bible, but you've got to start to understand it. Because anybody will come to you and go, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. And you've got to know, hold on, let's go to that verse. Wait a minute. Let's dig into that a little bit. Hey, Jehovah's Witnesses, they know the Bible. It's a funky Bible, and they interpret it totally different. But they will bring Scripture to you. And if you don't know what you're doing, you'll think, well, he didn't reference the Bible. And that's a scary thing because it's not going to matter at the end. You're not going to come before the great throne and go, yeah, you know, this guy told me I was good. It's not going to matter. So we have to get to know our Bibles and we have to get to know the Word. Second, be ready. Be ready. I find it interesting that in Acts 20, when Paul gets together with the elders of Ephesus before he goes on his mission trip, his encouragement to them was this. Listen, this is the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he warns them of. He says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that at my departure the savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you every night and day with tears. So Paul has this get together with the, el- with the elders and are they talking about Church planning strategy. You know, listen, try this program and make sure that you guys do this when it comes to PR and this for advertising. Make sure that you do your trainings like this. Get in a, rent out a big conference room and bring in some of the best speakers from around the world and get together. He doesn't say any of that. He says, listen, I've been warning you guys for years, night and day with tears. Satan is going to come in and he's going to try to dupe you and it's going to come from within. And so get ready. And if Paul was going to warn his flock of that, then we should take the same exact warning. That means that it's coming, gang. It's coming for us. People are going to come in and they're going to, they're going to try to dupe our family and our friends and people within our fellowship. And so we've got to be very careful and we've got to get to know our word. And lastly... We've got to sort out religion versus relationship with fear and trembling. We as Christians are not a part of a religion. And we have to be able to understand that. Religion is what Satan did. Relationship is what Jesus did. Jesus came to destroy it. He, he took away the curtain that kept us between man, that kept us between God. Jesus said that way is gone. You now can have direct direct access to God. But what did the church start to do? Not even that long after that. They started to come in between again. Come pray to us. And then we will we'll pray. And you can do Hail Marys. And you can do this. And you can do that. And well, you know, you can... You, may, you know, whenever you die, you may go into purgatory for a little bit. Do you know what that is? That's putting something in between. Jesus came to destroy all that. You don't have to go to a confessional to talk to God. You don't have to go to a confessional to get right with God. The separation has been broken. Red flags are any system that puts itself in between you and God. That place is only for Jesus. So when the Mormons come in and say, listen, if you start getting into our way of teaching, you yourself will become like a God. Red flag. Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a a stage or steps of enlightenment. That the longer that you're a part of it, the more enlightenment you'll get. Red flag. Anytime that somebody is put in between you and God, come to me and I will teach you. It's a red flag. Let me say this in the nicest way possible. You don't need me to get to God. You don't need me to learn about God. You don't need Calvary Chapel to learn about God. 
Now, the church is God's system for getting his word out to the world. And we get together and we equip each other and we edify each other and we build something up. But this has nothing to do with your salvation in terms of being here every Sunday. If you don't come next week, your salvation is going to be exactly the same. And so we've got to be careful when places come in and say, well, you're, you, know, you have to do this and you have to do that. No, you don't. That's religion. And religion is Babylon. Relationship is Jesus. Jesus Christ came to set us free. And we are free indeed. It is wrong for somebody else to come back in and say, you need to do. No, you don't. You need to give your life to Jesus. That has nothing to do with me. Or even when, when I'm ministering it, sometimes I'll say, listen, the way that you come to know Jesus is through a prayer. But that's just the way that we, that's the, the, the way that we use to get that. You don't even have to do that. The thief on a cross didn't pray some special prayer or put his hand up and stand and do an altar call. He was on a cross. There's this conversion that happens in the heart. We tend to do it through a prayer. But even sometimes it's through a conversation. And so when people say, well, you know, I was at a, a concert and they asked people to raise their hand and that's how everybody got saved. That's how people can get saved. That doesn't mean that every single person there made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And so we've got to be careful because some people can say, listen, I prayed that prayer and I'm good. If you prayed that prayer and you confessed with your mouth and you believed with your heart that Jesus is Lord, then yeah, you're good. But if you said it just because you wanted life insurance, you're not good. And so the one thing that I hope that we take from this chapter is the danger of religion and the need for relationships. The amazing thing is that Jesus gave that to us. And we all have the opportunity to walk in it. Amen? Amen. Chapter 18 next week. Uh, I don't know if we'll do 18 and 19 together, but we'll dig into more of Babylon. And then Jesus starts to make everything right. Let's pray, and then we'll enjoy some time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for this